Well, hey and welcome. This is my third attempt to review Act 1, Scene 1 with Taming of the Shrew. This is for those of you who have missed the live review or who need a second review. Um, both are acceptable options. It's a little bit shorter than the live review itself. This is not supposed to replace the live review. It's really supposed to um, be sort of a secondary element to it. So don't think that you can skip my live review and just do this. Um, in Act 1, Scene 1 of Taming of the Shrew, first of all, we've skipped the induction with Christopher Sly. We do not need Christopher Sly in our lives. Other Shakespeare scholars can come at me. We don't need him right now. Um, it, it's a much more straightforward, kind of enjoyable story to dissect without Christopher Sly being in there. In the opening scene, there's a few things happening. Act 1 is only two scenes long. And the point of at least Act 1, Scene 1 is that you meet like 90% of your characters. Petruchio is going to come along next scene, and then we've met everyone, and we're pretty good. Um, in the first sequence, we meet people, and we hear the central problem, which is that Bianca is highly desirable. People want to marry her, but her father won't allow her to marry until her older sister Katerina is married. And remember, I said, depending on the version you're reading, the one we're reading that MIT hosts is um, Katerina, but sometimes you see Catherine, sometimes you see Kate or Kat, they're all the same person, um, and she is something else. We'll get to her. In the opening sequence, Lucentio and Tranio are talking. Now, I just want to talk about their relationship, why they're where they are, um, because I think it helps as we go through. Also, I want you to note, you have a Google Doc, and it's on editing permission, so you can see my comments on the side. I have highlighted and then made comments, usually translating them, please feel free to read those. In this opening scene, there are not many instances where you need to look at the Shakespearean language in any kind of particular way. You need to understand why they're saying what they're saying because Shakespeare's doing that to establish what kind of character they are. Um, I can translate that for you and then you get all the establishment you need so that later when we need to stare at Shakespeare's English, you're not too burned out on it. In this opening sequence, it's more about understanding why characters are here, what we're kind of looking to do with the rest of our time. Um, there's only a couple lines that I kind of want you to look at in any particular fashion. Lucentio is talking about basically he, he's done with school, he's coming to Italy with his man, Tranio, and he, he's looking to set himself up. Lucentio is wealthy, he's young, he's attractive. He's always like the good casting when they make a movie in case we had trouble deciding which of Bianca suitors was our favorite. Um, we are always kind of pushed towards Lucentio with good casting. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, um, the guy who plays Basil in, in position in Austin Powers, but when he's young and attractive. I forget his name, I'm sorry, but I've seen that version a lot. Uh, he's always the one we're going for. Lucentio and Tranio tend to go together. So like in 10 Things I Hate About You, it's um, the, the AV guy that shows the Joseph Gordon-Levitt character around. His man. So in Shakespeare, when they say his man, it means a man's servant. You would kind of translate that to modern time as like a butler, like Batman and Alfred. But it's not quite as impersonal as you might be thinking. We don't necessarily have relationships like this anymore. The closest I could give you is like someone's personal assistant. So when Lucentio is sent off to school, his father sends him with Tranio for a couple reasons. One, you do not want to send the kid off to school alone. You need someone to watch over him, make sure he doesn't like drink too much, spend all of his money, or generally make a lot of mistakes. You want someone kind of keeping him on task. Two, you want somebody his age because you don't want to send like a grandmotherly or grandfatherly figure off with him that he's going to naturally try to get away from in order to go live his life as a young man. Like you want the guy that he is going to bring to parties with him, that he is going to talk to about all the things on his mind. These relationships were really much friendlier and more intimate. Like it's closer to having a brother. You'll certainly see the way Tranio and Lucentio talk to each other. There's a bromance going on. They are besties. Um, so even though one is technically the employer of the other, it's not that dry. Um, as we continue to look down, 
you have some instances where Shakespeare's just showing off. So you don't necessarily need to take note of every time Shakespeare says something kind of impressive. Um, the first instance for me is Tranio going, me perdona to a gentle master, I am and all affected as yourself, yada yada. Let's be no Stoics nor Stocks, I pray, or so devote to Aristotle's checks as Ovid be an outcast, quite abjured, blah, blah, blah. Shakespeare knows his stuff. He knows it well. He's fluent in Latin. He knows his histories, his mythologies. He throws it out there. Um, it, it, you don't always need to understand every reference he's making to understand the point of what he's making. Essentially, these boys are well-educated. Tranio it gets to go to school for free because he's going with his master. So even though he's not wealthy, he's just as smart. It's going to come up very helpful for them that they are newly educated and they have it all in their mind. You'll see why at the end of the scene. Um, as they are in the town, they see the big family group with the suitors. So Baptista, Caterina, and Bianca, they're all family, walking in followed closely by Gremio and Hortensio, who are uh, suitors to Bianca. Now, Hortensio is the only one I listed on your character sheet because he's sort of a big deal suitor. The other suitors all start playing secondary roles to him. They become like his sidekicks. He's the one that like continually kind of comes into play. But there's this big group that come in, so Lucentio and Tranio are just watching. Then this is where we get the reveal of everything we're going to be dealing with. Um, Baptista, gentlemen, importune me no further, for how I firmly am resolved you know that is not to bestow my youngest daughter before I have a husband for the elder. If either of you love Katerina, because I know you and love you well, leave shall you have to court her at your pleasure. And they both sort of go, ooh, not that one. As soon as Gremio sort of goes, she's too rough for me, Hortensio, will you have her? Katerina bites back. Now, a note on Baptista before we get to Katerina. Um, for my money, there's no better casting than the father in 10 Things I Hate About You, who is bumbling, um, sort of pitiable looking. Um, he's trying really hard to be the disciplinarian, but he often comes off a little foolish. Um, in this time period, fathers were expected to run their households in terms of discipline at any rate. Mothers raised children, mothers nurtured, mothers were in charge of things like feeding and clothing, but fathers were in charge of discipline. So the fact that these girls, or at least Katerina, doesn't listen reflects very poorly on Baptista. The fact that he can't figure out how to solve that reflects even worse on him. Um, if you were at least actively trying to solve your problem, People might have a little more sympathy for you, but his solution is just pawn her off on a husband. And he's having trouble doing that, even though he's wealthy. He's dangling money in front of people saying, please take my money and my daughter. And he cannot convince anyone to do it. Um, he, he, a lot of people don't respect him. And we see that as the play goes on, that he doesn't seem to be very um, respected as a man. He's wealthy, which always gets you some level of respect, but he's not a man. As soon as Gremio says something essentially like, ooh, Katerina, Katerina bites back. A, she was not asked for her opinion. B, does she bite back? So you guys see her opening line and probably go, mm, boo, like you don't really understand why it's a big deal. But she goes, I pray you, sir, is it your will to make a stale of me among these mates? So her father offers her up to these guys and she is punning, like at the highest level of pun. Um, the comparisons I like to make, so puns are sort of out of style for most regular people in this time, but you know who still uses them? Rappers. Do you know what kind of, what rappers are really good at using them? One in particular, Eminem. I refer you to Eminem's recent rap battle with Machine Gun Kelly. It is so clear that Machine Gun Kelly has no ability to rap at Eminem's level. He just doesn't have the linguistic ability to write the way Eminem does. It is obvious that Eminem can pun in this way. So like a word, like the wording that Katerina uses, a stale of me among these mates, is actually swapped out in the Elizabeth Taylor version we're going to be kind of partially viewing as we go along. Um, and in those partial versions that we're looking at, uh, the word that they swap out instead of stale of me among these mates is whore of me among these mates. They did that for other people's ease, but it ruins the effect. In Shakespeare's time, Katerina coming out, making this her opening line, is like a boom, 
dis moment in a rap battle. Like, it's like, damn, she said that. One, she's coming at her father. Are you sort of pawning me out cheaply to these people? Um, when she says stale and mate, a stalemate is a no-win situation. So in like a game of chess, when the two players cannot make further moves to advance the game, no one wins, no one loses, but no one wins. More importantly, no one wins. That's a stalemate. So she's basically saying to your to her father, are you creating a no win situation? Like, I don't want to marry these guys. They don't want to marry me. Nobody wants this. Um, also, mating in chess, because it, it's more of a chess reference by my reading of it anyway. Um, mating someone, checkmating someone is defeating them. So she's implying also that she would be the one doing the checkmating. And if you make a stale of me among these mates, the other thing is like giving her out like stale bread cheaply. Hence the reason that in the one version they swap it out with whore. Um, like the imp implication is like anyone can take this daughter. We'll be pickier with the second daughter, but anyone, anyone who wants this stale piece of bread can have it. Um, the fact that she immediately snarks back at her father and the two other suitors who are well-respected men would have been enough to sort of shock people but the graphicness of that language for their time for your time you're like boo she's not saying anything um but for their time that's pretty graphic and she's just biting directly at them that that would have set her off very differently than other people on the stage um the men kind of go like oh hortensio no mates for you unless you were of gentler milder mold and she essentially says well i'll read it to you because it's so good if faith sir you shall never need to fear. I wish it not halfway to her heart, but if it were, doubt not her care should to comb your noodle with a three-legged stool and paint your face and use you like a fool. Um, so what she's saying here is, any wife of yours, but particularly me if I were wife of yours, will make a damn fool out of you. And the imagery of the three-legged stool and the, the, I'm going like this because it's like a coxcomb, she's basically saying, I will cheat on you rampantly and make a fool out of you so don't come over here telling me that i'm i'm any kind of difficult person because i'll make your life difficult she's so so saucy um and a lot of people would have been turned off by that particularly in shakespeare's time you don't want a handful of a woman what i find funny is that tranio and lucentio who are not from the town and haven't lived around her difficultness for years uh, Tranio's line is that wench is stark mad or wonderful forward so she's either crazy or just the most honest person alive and Lucentio's like hush she has a much more attractive sister um, and then right in front of everyone Baptista first of all he's saying all this stuff so you know it's been worse than that for years but think of the sisters like you're meant to kind of love your sister Cat um, or Baptista says uh, come on, Bianca, let's get you inside. Let me get you something that's going to calm you down. And Kat uh, basically threatens to poke her sister directly in the eye. Because sisters. Um, and then Bianca goes, sister, content you in my discontent. Sir, to your pleasure humbly I subscribe. My books and instruments shall be my company, and on them to took and practice myself. Now, Lucentio, in love with her at first sight. Um, Hortensio and Gremio decide, like, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, even though they have been competing for Bianca's hand. They, they're, they're going to join forces to try and find someone to marry Kat so that they can then fight over Bianca again. They realize that the first thing they have to do is to get Bianca, I mean, to get Katerina married. Baptista interestingly says, oh, you know, I know that I've set my foot down with this rule, but I feel so bad for only Bianca because he's she's the only one he seems to care about and because bianca loves art and music i'm gonna hire tutors to bring into my house while she's essentially on house arrest awaiting her sister's wedding um and i'm gonna bring tutors in for her entertainment and hortensio and gremio are like okay whatever file that away let's focus on finding katerina a husband lucentio though clever boy clever clever boy says to himself, tutors will be allowed to see her probably for several hours a day. He decides he's going to disguise himself as a tutor to get closer to Bianca. 
smart boy. Now, obviously, people are expecting Lucentio to be in Padua and, and doing his social stuff. So he looks at Tranio and he's like, do you want to pretend to be me? And Tranio's like, do I want to pretend to be the wealthy guy? Yes, I will do this for you. Clever. Now, the last thing I want to say to you guys is Bianca. There are a couple different ways to read Bianca. You can only read Katerina as this like bitey shrew. But her sister, there's some disagreement on this. Some people play Bianca like she is just a goody little two-shoes angel child who is always doing what she's told. Some people play her dumb, like she doesn't know any better. So it's like, okay, daddy, whatever you say. Um, she's played dumb in 10 Things I Hate About You, which is one of the best versions of this play ever done. Then there's another version. There's a version where she's just like her sister, where she's smart enough um, and she understands exactly what's going on around her, but she is a little different in her approach than Kat. So she's maybe mentally thinking all the same things Katarina's thinking, but she knows it's better to say what her father wants her to. So she says to daddy things like, yes, daddy, whatever you say, that's what I want, but she's manipulating him. You can do something with all three reads. I used to read Bianca as dumb, like not smart, as smart as her sister, and therefore sort of like just the pretty dumb one that everyone wanted. As I reread it, I like the manipulative Bianca more, especially at the end. There's more payoff for manipulative Bianca at the end. Um, you guys have to answer 10 questions that are on Google Classroom. And in addition, you have a fun comparison video where it's three different opening sequences. Um, I want to show you guys always this play in motion. You should never read plays. You should see them. Um, but also once you read them and you, you kind of know what to expect, seeing them add something to how you think about them and seeing different versions of them really helps. Um, so let me know if you have questions. I hope this was useful to you. Have a good day.